Thank you, Karin. My name is uh, Sverre, I'm a biologist, and I've got 20 minutes to uh, speak to you about strategies to avoid too high or too low humidity. That's not uh, by far sufficient, so I think I will jump to the summary right now. Uh, stressing too low humidity, uh, a little bit more than than the high humidity which we have been working for for years, and it's pretty well known in the northern countries. So I think. Uh, to avoid too low humidity, uh, should consider a combination of the following actions: using uh, hygroscopic materials, decreasing indoor temperatures, adding moisture sources, reducing the ventilation rate when appropriate, uh, recovering moisture, and in some situation, or some situations, all you can also consider humidification. And for all uh, the above. Uh, suggested actions. Uh, it's important that you avoid that the moisture gets too high. There are some limitation cha limitations and challenges to all these individual actions. So I think uh, we're not ready to um, recommend a very specific package. But I think these would be elements. Okay, uh, what do we mean by too high or too low indoor moisture? Uh, I guess most of you have encountered more than once uh, graphs uh, looking more or less like this, um, trying to convey the uh, the impression that uh, there is an optimum safe zone of relative humidity between 40 and 60 percent uh, indoors. And if you uh, follow these, uh, you will minimize adverse health effects. Um, often it's referred to a publication from 1986 by Aaron Sterling at uh, Alea, and this is the original. You might uh, already hear note that uh, there are some discrepancies between what are graph to the left and the graph to the right. right? And if you spend some time on the internet, you can make a nice collection of graphs that are in a little bit different. But never mind that. Um, uh, this is um, the um, original uh, graph, and it's based on a literature review. If you look at some of the references uh, that are included in the review, this seems to be a little bit more complicated than the authors have concluded. Uh, for instance, uh, case controls uh, for humidity where, and, and fungi and indoor air, where cases are 25 and the controls are 26% relative humidity. I can't go through it in details, but I think it's fair to say that it's better to uh, uh, look at the um, total literature, and the picture is considerably more complicated than what is conveyed to this through this single diagram. OK, uh, a note on different ways of telling the moisture. Relative humidity is absolutely a useful measure, but in many situations, it's more interesting to, and perhaps more practical, to use other ways um, of stating uh, moisture content, like, for instance, the absolute humidity, the moisture excess, or, or, or the dew point. Uh, as you all know, the relative humidity changes when the temperature change. So uh, a relative humidity could increase by 8% when you decrease the temperature from 23 to 20. Um, uh, we were at the um, too high uh, moisture levels. And we have some, some data indicating that, at least for uh, the Norwegian situation, um, Moisture is involved in about three out of four building damages. 
and uh, moist indoor air is um, involved in about 15% of, of all these damages. Um, the data source is a little bit biased towards large buildings uh, and non-trivial cases, so uh, the situation might be different in, in dwellings and possibly a moist indoor air uh, would uh, be an even more important uh, source of uh, moisture damage in, in, in those buildings. Um, the existing buildings are clearly vulnerable to high humidity uh, as they have cold surfaces including windows and thermal bridges. Uh, they have air leakages uh, and there are cold areas that are ventilated with outdoor air and you can have some recompensation in those. So, uh, mold, uh, mold fungi are not at all uncommon and it can be rather dra dramatic. Uh, also, uh, the supply air tend to be uh, uncomfortably cold, uh, leading to low ventilation rates. For instance, because the, the uh, inhabitants uh, close the, uh, the vents. Newer buildings are a little bit different. Um, they are typically built with uh, very uh, well insulated uh, building envelopes uh, with few thermal bridges. bridges. Uh, windows with small heat loss and uh, efficient heat recovery mechanical ventilation and, uh, and a, a very importantly an airtight building envelope. So if the indoor humidity gets a little bit high it doesn't matter because you won't have condensation or you won't have uh, mold fungi uh, growing. Uh, so the situation in new and, and older buildings are different and we should perhaps consider that. Um, also remember that uh, most of you, I guess, are not plants, so relative humidity is not the only important humidity uh, measure for health and comfort. Your eyes, uh, for instance, my uh, colleague Kari's eye here, will be uh, subject to evaporation, um, certainly in an office environment at 25% relative humidity. But the same will happen if she goes outdoor in 80% relative humidity and minus 6 degrees. Uh, so it's the um, pressure difference that drives the evaporation and uh, uh, absolute humidity or, or um, partial pressure of water vapor would be a better way to uh, assess that than the relative humidity. But for my office plant, uh, Things are, of course, uh, different, and relative humidity is, is a good measure. Okay, um, indoor humidity determined by the sources indoors. Uh, if we have um, supply air that will contain moisture, and as well will the extract air, it will remove moisture. Uh, some of that moisture can be recycled, uh, and Pong will speak uh, about that a little bit later. Um, and also the uh, the mass pollens are here will be mediated by buffering in materials, um, and the mass balance and the temperature will determine the relative humidity, of course. Uh, I have put in some very minor arrows to indicate that it's possible for moisture to diffuse in or out of the building, but that's not uh, really anything that will be of importance in, in practical situations that we have encountered so far at least. Um, okay, so uh, the moisture content outside is of course very important here uh, because it's the raw material and it determines how efficiently you could remove moisture from, from the indoor air, whether you want it or, or not. So this is uh, a year in, in Oslo. Um, each, each circle here uh, represents one hour. And uh, you will see that uh, we have quite uh, long periods many observations where you have to 
use a lot of uh, you had to add a lot of um, uh, moisture uh, in order to reach say 40 percent relative humidity even at the relatively low temperature of 21 degrees and if you were to reach 60 percent uh, relative humidity and 33 degrees is the upper green level here. So uh, that means that uh, the outer air in this period is very efficient, probably too efficient, in removing the moisture from the indoor. Sorry about that. Uh, and of course, your local climate would uh, determine if uh, the potential uh, a, 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 a um, oceanic climate like Dublin, of course, has a much smaller capacity of removing uh, moisture from by supplying outdoor air. And uh, if you are lucky and living in a warm oceanic like Porto, the main problem is probably that you supply uh, humidity from the outdoor air. And if you are in the continental climate, uh, the example here, Minsk, you will see that you have extended periods of both very high and, and uh, very low and, and quite high uh, outdoor humidity levels. So what to do about it? Um, we could do buffering, um, we could reduce temperature, we could reduce ventilation rates and add moisture, and we could try to recover moisture, and we could leave it as it is, and just trying to compensate for, for the, uh, the, the bad parts. Um, Of course, buffering will only reduce the variation. Uh, reducing the temperature will increase only the relative humidity, while uh, the next uh, steps will increase both absolute and relative humidity. Uh, so, buffering, uh, it's quite clear when you do a laboratory experiments, starting with an aluminium clad uh, laboratory, um, that putting in uh, in uh, materials that can absorb moisture will uh, dampen the fluctuations. So e even something like a painted gypsum board uh, will change uh, the, uh, the amplitude uh, of the variations and uh, enable, to an ever long, bigger extent will untreated spruce do the same. Uh, so that's for a laboratory situation. Uh, we have some very nice field studies from uh, Finland and, uh, and Estonia. Uh, this is Finland, uh, where they have compared um, buildings with different uh, surface properties, and I see that it's a difference when they regarded the surfaces as hygroscopic versus non-hygroscopic. But note that the um, variation within each group is quite large. And it's the same on, on, uh, on the figure on the right, which is from the same uh, paper by Colin et al. Different uh, categories of buildings are a little bit different in their amplitude of uh, humidity fluctuations. But uh, again, a large uh, variation within each group. And if we start with uh, Oslo climate, this is um, uh, the uh, measurements from hour to hour of uh, outdoor uh, absolute humidity. Uh, if we do the 48 hour our uh, average, uh, we see that it, it's clearly uh, a damping effect, uh, moving the, the, the tops and the bottoms of the graphs. 
And the same with the week average, but we also see that there's a very strong seasonal effect, which is almost exclusively driven by the outdoor temperature. And that's sort of impossible to, to buffer away. You can't really store uh, a winter's worth of, uh, of moisture in, in your building materials. So buffering will be for short-term variation. Uh, we could reduce the indoor temperature. Um, the example uh, at, we see here at low temperature, uh, low relative humidity, um, the effect won't be very large. It's perhaps we could raise it from 20 to 26 percent, and then probably uh, the users will have started complaining about being cold uh, for quite some time. So it's uh, quite limited. And uh, as you saw, those of you who followed the last seminar, um, energy efficient homes, they are cheap and easy to heat. Uh, so it's likely that mo more people will uh, prefer increasing their temperatures than actually reducing them. So, but I refer to, to, uh, to the presentation by Laurent Georges uh, at the last webinar. I think personally that we will be likely to see bare feet in uh, residence this uh, in the winter time in the future because people like it. Um, then we could try to increase the moisture excess. Uh, that would be more efficient. We could add go from. 1.5 grams to 4 grams uh, moisture excess and move the uh, indoor air and perhaps reach a relative humidity of 40%. And that's something. Of course, uh, we will simultaneously see an increase in, uh, in the dew point, so we must make sure that we don't have condensation and all sorts of bad things. We could increase the excess by reducing the ventilation. Um, the lowest indoor relative humidity normally coincides, uh, coincides with uh, polluted outdoor air periods, um, freezing risk in heat exchangers, uh, and peak energy demand. So it uh, would be sort of tempting. Uh, it's also clear that it's a uh, time of the year where people spend a lot of time indoors, so they should be entitled to a good indoor environment. So we can't really risk that. And they lit can light candles, which they probably shouldn't do. Um, respiration, that's a free uh, source of, uh, of moisture. Again, my colleague uh, Kari uh, considered that uh, one, one net and one clow. Uh, will probably uh, evaporate about 40 to 60 grams of water per hour, uh, 15 liters of CO2, and uh, one olfactory unit. So if we ventilate to achieve uh, a CO2 level at 1000 ppm, uh, we will perhaps be able to add 1.5 or, or 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 a little more uh, grams per square uh, per cubic meter to the air, which uh, will increase uh, the moisture level without, without uh, obviously uh, impairing the uh, indoor air quality. One one minute, please. Yep, uh, moisture recovery. I'm very happy that Pong will cover that in a minute. Um, uh, so we won't go into this. Uh, even a traditional uh, moisture recovery unit will recover some moisture if you have condensations in inside. Of course, we have some additional sources. Some of them aren't very practical. We shouldn't really start showering in order to increase your uh, door humidity. Maybe drying out clothes isn't that dangerous, uh, so we should perhaps stop telling people that they mustn't do it. We could increase uh, moisture excess by humidification, but uh, biological um, uh, growth is a clear risk, and it's 
costly energy-wise. And then we could perhaps uh, do something to uh, just uh, stay clear of the ill effect, like e remove irritants, uh, moisten their eyes and airways, and so on, uh, and make a robust construction that's not really uh, susceptible to large problems, even if the, the, the humidity is a little bit high. So, um, as suspected, I spent all my time and then some, uh, but uh, luckily we have already been through the summary. <laughs>